an exchange. And so that, that's co- it's co-located with the exchange so that the orders are sent immediately to the exchange as fast as possible. Um, last summer, I went out to this new facility that the New York Stock Exchange is building in New Jersey, the size of three football fields. It's going to be filled with computers that are co-located with the New York Stock Exchange and uh, will be processing massive amounts of orders. It'll be, you know, it, it's it's a huge endeavor. And there are actually a lot of these other data centers in mostly located in New Jersey where other exchanges are, they set up big computers and they co-locate uh, all these hedge funds and high-frequency firms and, and mutual funds and everybody. Uh, banks ha- are co-located, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, um, and this is just this is what the market is now. It's a big computer. It's not people calling up each other on the phone and you know saying I want to buy you know a million shares of IBM. It's pressing a button and and, and having it sent to these da- data centers, and it's all happened really quickly. And uh, the SEC and other regulators are trying to keep up with it, um, but it's just this is the future. There's no stopping it. Wow. Then there's probably no way to really regulate it, is there? Every one of these quant activities is going on in major infrastructure in the financial industry. Definitely. Yes, and we haven't even touched on derivatives. I know. <laughs> you know that, that's, uh, you know, another area that I explore in, in the book is... A lot. Yeah. The derivatives and, and those, you know, derivatives had a, a big, uh, really at the center of the meltdown. And uh, these are quant creations. These are mathematical uh, constructs that are very complicated and involve, uh, you know, shifting money around between parties in very complex ways and, and, uh, you know, credit fault swaps, obviously. You know, everybody, I remember a couple years ago, I would ask my friends or family and say, have you guys heard of a credit fault swap? And they'd say, "No, what are you talking about?" Um, because I knew, I, you know, I, I could see in in covering the markets that these things were becoming very popular and uh, and dangerous. And people that I knew, you know, I'd say, "What do you think the biggest risk to the system is?" And they would say, "Well, these credit fault swaps are going all over the place." And um, even nobody really knew how big it was getting. Um, but uh, you know. It hasn't even it hasn't slowed down. I looked just the other day at a, a chart showing the growth of derivatives on Wall Street, and it's it's only gotten bigger um, in the past few years. Didn't Bernanke give seven hundred billion dollars? And when he was asked what was it in, and he said credit default swaps. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Most of us did not understand what that meant. Yeah, that he can't figure out what it went to because it went into credit default swap. So it was like another matrix it went into, and then whatever happened with that was dispersed outward. Right. Did you understand that? Well, you know, basically, you know, a lot of it was credit default swaps. Um, AIG is a a perfect example. Um, What AIG was doing was they were entering one side of the uh, credit default swap trade, which was uh, a credit default swap is basically uh, insurance on a bond. Um, there, it's really not that complicated, although the, the, the term sounds uh, devilishly complex, but, you know, it's a uh, credit, you're, it's a bet on credit defaulting. Um, so AIG was writing the insurance. They were saying if this uh, debt defaults, we are going to pay up. And a lot of what the uh, the debt that they were underwriting was uh, was were subprime mortgage bonds or uh, collateralized debt obligations. If you want to get it to another level of uh, quant complexity, um, these these were very, you know probably the most toxic security Wall Street has ever created. And and AIG was underwriting billions and billions of of this stuff with no uh, idea of how risky it was. So when those defaults happened and AIG uh, couldn't meet their obligations, um, they were essentially bankrupt and 
the the government needed to step in and back those debts because if they didn't, uh, they they owed money to Goldman Sachs or uh, a lot of other uh, firms. Those banks would have to write down their own assets, and it would have rippled through the entire financial system. So, so by the government coming in and, and saying we'll make good on those bets, the other banks didn't need to write stuff down. But there's been a lot of criticism over that action because uh, basically the government was right, uh, guaranteeing those debts 100% instead of saying, okay, you know, the, you, know you lost money on some of uh, on these uh, trades, so we're going to only give you 80% of it, you know, to, to the banks. Um, they gave them all the money. So uh, It's like a dysfunctional you know, system where you actually cover the gambler's losses. Right. Really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, that definitely is what's what's happened. It and uh, you know, they call it moral hazard, and it seems to have only gotten worse. Have you ever been concerned releasing this book, even though it's a New York Times bestseller for your well-being? Um, <laughs> you, I, you know, when I was writing it, I got kind of paranoid, um, and. Uh, you know, because I, I think that there there's a lot of things that people are trying to uh, hide on Wall Street, and and maybe uh, I, you know I thought um, people might think that I'm digging into stuff that I shouldn't, and and then when it came out, I thought that uh, there would be a backlash, but I think that a lot of these guys that I wrote about are just perf- they just prefer to remain quiet about it because I, I think that if they uh, if they came out and said anything, or you know, th- they might draw more attention to it. So I think they're just hoping it dies and goes away. <laughs> I, I want to be clear: like I'm not writing about any illegal activities that any of these. But I'm not saying that any of them are doing anything illegal. They were they were really uh, doing. They were operating within within the laws. They were just doing things that were a lot riskier than uh, it seemed to them. And they were, you know, part of what I'm trying to say is. This whole uh, system that has built up over decades has in- encouraged this. It's a it's a belief system. It's an ideology, and uh, and it's it's taken over Wall Street. Um, but there's nothing illegal about it, as far as I I know. I mean, I think there were some illegal activities that uh, went on, um, some very bad behavior, at least. In terms of you know structuring some of these these deals, the the subprime deals, that and and people are still looking into that stuff. You write about this culture of alpha. Uh-huh. Is it a culture of alpha or is it a cult of alpha? <laughs> <laughs> it, Maybe the quants are a cult. Cult like it is very cult like. I mean, they they have their own language. You know, it takes. It takes a lot of time to figure out what these guys are saying. You know, I think that's part you know, part of the hardest uh, challenge for me was figuring out when you when you talk to these people, they've got all this jargon that they use, and you know, eventually I was able to decipher it because I'm not a quant. I, I'm a reporter who just learned about this world and had access to it. Um, but it, you know, I read a lot of books and eventually was able to you know make some sense of it. And they have this thing called Alpha. They worship it. It's some to me. It seems like something out of the Kabbalah, or uh, you know, it's uh, this belief that certain people are endowed with the ability to uh, to beat the market consistently. It's also a mathematical measurement of how much you can beat the market by. But it very it seems very mystical when you can, you know uh, you, the more you learn about it, it it's almost like you know being a you know superhero or something. Interesting. How come you think it is that they were willing to talk with you? There must be something in you that engendered trust, dialogue, etc., to come up with the synthesis of the quants as a book. Uh, what is it? I I knew some of these people beforehand. Um, I had written about some of their strategies uh, before things really went awry for them. I also it started the book in uh, late 2007, early 2008, before a lot of them really had their major problems. So they didn't know how bad things were going to get. I had a sense that 
all of this was not over, 